the end of the Cold War and the discovery of oil on the southern edge of the Arabian Peninsula created a new situation in Yemen. After centuries of colonial rule and decades of division, Yemen was not only going to gain its independence, but be united as well. However, the economic problems, poor governance and internal fragmentation that had plagued the region in the previous decades had not gone anywhere, and very soon after the unification, all these problems reared their ugly heads. Welcome to our video on the modern history of Yemen, its civil wars, the Houthi movement and the current state of affairs in this country. This video is made available for free thanks to our YouTube members and patrons. We fund our free content through our program of exclusive videos made for our members and patrons, who get two documentaries per week not available to the public. We've got a growing collection featuring the First Punic War, the History of Prussia, the Italian Unification Wars, and a review of the classic text Xenophon's Anabasis. We're now covering the Russo-Japanese War and Albigensian Crusades, not to mention our massive Pacific War week-by-week -week coverage, and a massive pool of other projects. All this is made for and with generous donations from our backers. So if you're enjoying our content and want to see more and support the cause of history, consider becoming a YouTube member or patron. You'll also get early access to public content, a spot in our lively Discord server, and behind-the-scenes info and goodies. We rely on our backers to support our growing team pumping out these videos, so thank you to everyone already involved, and we hope you'll consider joining in too. After the formal unification of the Yemen Arab Republic and the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen into one nation, the leader of the former, Ali Abdullah Saleh, became the president of the country, while the leader of the latter, Ali Salem al-Baid, was given the position of vice president. North Yemen had a higher population than the south, with approximately 12 million people compared to 2 to 3 million. Because of this, the North would be given a higher proportion of representation in the new state apparatus, with 26 individuals from North Yemen taking part in the election of the Presidential Council, alongside 17 Southern Yemeni counterparts. These 43 representatives would rule the country through its transitional period. Beneath them, a provisional parliament with 159 members, with 159 members from the north and 111 from the south, was established to carry out lawmaking until proper elections could be held. North Yemen's larger population, combined with the fact that South Yemen was transitioning into the political and economic system of North Yemen, inevitably made Sana'a the senior partner in this coalition. Thus, it was only a matter of time before the southern Yemeni people began to sense that they were being eaten by a larger neighbor and grow discontent with this new status quo. Despite the unification and the oil the country was now selling, Yemen was still a pretty poor country, particularly by the standards of the other countries of the Arabian Peninsula. Because of this, many Yemenis left the country to find work in Saudi Arabia. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, the Yemeni government refused to support the military intervention in Iraq. Saudi Arabia was one of the key members of the anti-Saddam coalition, and in retaliation, they expelled 800,000 Yemeni laborers from their country. This was a major economic burden for an already economically embattled Yemen. Before long, there were food shortages across the country, and hunger riots broke out in 1992. In April 1993, Unified Yemen held its first parliamentary election. In it, Saleh's General People's Congress received the most votes and earned 122 seats, while the Islamist party of Al-Islah came in second. Meanwhile, the Yemeni Socialist Party, the former ruling party of South Yemen, trailed behind as a distant third, winning only 56 seats. Although these three parties formed a coalition, Saleh and his party were now the most dominant force in Yemeni politics, and southern influence in the newly unified nation was gradually dissipating. At the time of unification, the South was poorer, but basic services such as healthcare and education were at a higher level than in the North. However, the more populous, wealthy and powerful North was gradually imposing its dominance over the South and weakening the pre-existing systems there. Moreover, several Southern politicians were assassinated by the jihadists, and many blamed Saleh for the orchestration of this violence. The breaking point in the North-South relations occurred when Vice President al-Baid left the capital Sana'a for Aden in protest of the marginalization of the South. He stated that he would return to Sana'a only if the violence against his party and the economic marginalization of the South stopped. This impasse lasted for several months, 
until the document of pledge and agreement between the two sides was signed in January 1994. The agreement called for the review of the constitution and Yemen's economic programs, but ultimately it did nothing to stop another civil war in Yemen. Even after the unification, the armies of the two former Yemens had not been integrated together. Occasional skirmishes would occur between the north and south throughout the spring of 1993, which culminated in a tank battle in Amran in April of 1993. The point of no return occurred on May 4th, when the two belligerent forces started bombarding each other. Another civil war in Yemen had officially begun. The northern army, supported by the jihadists, very quickly gained the upper hand, and on May 20th captured Alanad Air Base on the doorstep of the southern capital of Aden. The South responded by officially seceding from the unified Yemeni state and declaring the Democratic Republic of Yemen, with al Baid as the president. However, on May 24th, the Northern Army captured Atak, an important city on the way to Yemen's southern oil fields. Both sides targeted the oil installations of the other, inflicting severe damage to Yemen's economy that would impact the nation long after the conclusion of the civil war. In July, the North captured Aden. A few days later, the southern leaders fled Yemen, bringing the war to a conclusion, with the north as the victors. Now, Saleh and the north were in full control of a unified Yemen. Once again, the south was represented by a vice president, this time named Abd Rebbe Mansur Hadi. However, according to Stephen Day, Saleh was mainly interested in the appearance of power sharing, not genuine representation of southern interests in government. There were now fewer southerners in the cabinet, as Saleh chose to form a coalition with the Islam party. A Yemen analyst, April Longley Ali, argued that the civil war of 1993 created two different narratives in Yemen. Under one version, the war laid to rest the notion of separation and solidified national unity. According to the other, the war laid to rest the notion of unity and ushered in a period of northern occupation of the south. The second perception was, of course, prevalent in the south. Throughout the rest of the 1990s and until the Arab Spring, Saleh's position gradually became even stronger. Without needing to share his power with the southerners, he began to rule like a strongman, placing his family members and allies in key positions in government. Many members of his Sanhan tribe got positions in the army and security. When Saleh was finally deposed, a UN experts panel estimated that he had amassed between 32 to 60 billion dollars while in office. Having said that, it is tough to deny that he was the only Yemeni president who had a long rule, which was due to his ability to maintain stability against the background of a complicated system of tribal, sectarian and ideological relations in Yemen. Saleh himself compared his rule to dancing on the heads of snakes. Although Saleh sought to weaken and control his political opponents, unlike many Arab countries, he tolerated some degree of opposition to his rule. In both the 1999 and 2003 parliamentary elections, GPC got the majority, but al Isla gained a considerable number of seats too. However, in 2009, he postponed the elections, an act which reminded the world of the dictator that Saleh really was. In foreign policy, Yemen stabilized relations with Saudi Arabia initially by signing the Treaty of Jeddah, which defined the border between the two countries. But the Saudis later erected a wall on the border, citing smuggling from Yemen as the cause. In general, relations with the Saudis have been problematic ever since Yemen became independent. Saudi Arabia has interfered in every civil war fought in Yemen and has routinely engaged in border skirmishes with Yemeni forces. Saudi meddling in Yemeni affairs continues to this day. In America's War on Terror, Saleh sided with the United States, allowing the Americans to strike Al-Qaeda on Yemeni soil. However, it was claimed that Saleh was simultaneously helping and even directing al-Qaeda in Yemen. As usual, the Yemeni strongman was trying to manipulate the complicated situation in his favor, this time by playing both sides of the conflict. His long reign suggests that he was quite good at this kind of political maneuvering. However, such things don't last forever. Although Saleh was firmly in control of Yemen, he was far from winning the hearts and minds of all the Yemeni people. This is particularly true of the Zaydis of the north, some 40% of the Yemeni population, whose political power had been waning ever since the North Yemen Civil War in 1970. According to Marika Brandt, the economic and political marginalization of the Sadar region, the uneven distribution of economic resources and political participation, 
and the religious discrimination against its Saidi population provided fertile soil in which the Houthi movement could take root and blossom. In the 1990s, Hussein al-Houthi formed a Zaidi revivalist religious movement called the Believing Youth. He also formed his own political party, although it did not achieve much success in the conventional political process. The American invasion of Iraq and the rise of anti-American sentiments in Yemen, along with the rest of the Arab world, and Saleh's support of the United States, were some of the factors that led to the radicalization of this revivalist Houthi movement. Across Saidi mosques and schools, Hussein's slogan was repeated time and again, death to America, death to Israel, curse upon the Jews, victory to Islam. Saleh saw this growing movement as a threat to his regime, and in 2004, hundreds of al-Houthi supporters were arrested. After this, Saleh ordered the arrest of Hussein himself. However, Hussein evaded capture and responded by starting a rebellion against the Yemeni government. Even though Hussein al-Houthi was killed in September 2004, his death gave the Zaidi movement a martyr figure and eventually its name, the Houthis. Al-Houthi's death ended the first round of fighting in the Zaidi stronghold of Sada. After this, the government declared victory, despite the fact that the rebellion was far from being defeated. The second round of fighting took place in the spring of 2005, with Hussein's father, Badr al-Din al-Houthi, leading the rebels. Again, Saleh declared victory without actually achieving it. He also amnestied some arrested members of the Houthi movement to alleviate tensions. Ultimately, this did little to soothe the political climate, and the Third Sadar War started in November 2005, with fighting breaking out between pro-government and pro-Houthi tribes. The government interfered, but was again unable to crush the insurgency. Instead, Saleh once more attempted to placate the rebels by ordering the return of Hussein al-Houthi's house and assigning a government pension to the Houthi family. Evidently, however, the government's overtures did not really work because in January of 2007, the fourth Sadar war was started. The government accused the Houthis of harassing the local Jewish community and of being supported by Iran and Libya. Saleh also decided to recruit tribal forces to his attack on Sadar this time, which transformed the complexion of the conflict. According to Christopher Besek, the war between the Yemeni government and the Houthis had now acquired another layer. A largely sectarian conflict was now a tribal conflict as well. This got other groups within Yemeni society involved in the war. In June 2007, the two sides agreed to a Qatar-brokered deal, which envisaged the halt of all hostilities, the release of all prisoners within a month, the reconstruction of Sada, and the exile of the Houthi leaders. The fighting largely stopped after this agreement, but most of its provisions were not fulfilled, which paved the way for another round of conflict which started in March 2008. This time, the geography of the conflict expanded, as some fighting took place as far from Sada as Banu Hushaysh on the northern outskirts of Sana'a. The result was inconclusive once again, and in July 2008, Saleh unilaterally declared a ceasefire. The sixth and last round of the conflict between Saleh and the Houthis started in August 2009, triggered by an accusation by the government that the Houthis had kidnapped international aid workers. Saleh launched Operation Scorched Earth in August 2009 with the intention of defeating the Houthi insurgency once and for all. The government deployed 40,000 troops to Sada, recruited tribal forces to their cause, and subjected Houthi lands to heavy bombardment. Despite the fact that the government attacked with such overwhelming firepower, Saleh was unable to defeat the Houthis once again, and in February 2010, another ceasefire was signed. However, the fighting between the Houthis and the government was far from over. The aggressive policy of the government pushed even the non-religious people in the north to side with the Houthis, expanding their participation in the Houthi rebellion. Meanwhile, political fissures were appearing elsewhere in Yemen as well. The losing side of the 1994 civil war, the South, was growing increasingly unhappy with their state of affairs. Many southern bureaucrats and military personnel were forced to retire following Saleh's victory in the civil war. In 2006, protests largely led by the above groups were carried out, and the government's response was violent. This led to the emergence of the Al-Hirak movement, which aimed to gain more rights for the people in the south, and more parity in resource sharing in Yemen. The heavy-handed response of Saleh and the fierce resistance of the Houthis in the north gradually made the protests in the south more powerful. 
Between 2007 and 2009, some 100 protesters were killed by the government. By the time the Arab Spring started to shake the Middle East to its foundations, the calls for the secession of the South had increased. By late 2010, when protests erupted in Tunisia and Egypt, discontent with Saleh's rule reached a boiling point, as the Yemeni people grew fed up with his corruption, cronyism, the very poor economic situation in the country, and lack of representation of many Yemenis. All this made the arrival of the Arab Spring to Yemen inevitable. In January 2011, protests erupted in Sana'a, later spreading to Aden and Taiz. Initially, the protesters demanded government reform, but the violent suppression of the protests by the government and the victory of the revolution in Egypt changed the situation. Now, the broad protest coalition, which comprised the urban classes, marginalized southerners, Houthis, Shafis, and youths from different groups, were demanding the resignation of Saleh and a complete transformation of Yemen. The brutal crackdown on protests prompted new groups, including several major tribes, to join demonstrations. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Saleh called for a national unity government and elections, but the opposition was not seeking compromises anymore and rejected this, continuing to demand Saleh's immediate resignation. Despite the mounting pressure, Saleh continued to insist on remaining in power. On March 18th, 45 protesters were killed in Sana'a. Things were spiraling out of control, and Saleh declared a state of emergency. He was trying to manipulate and deceive his way out of another crisis, but this time the coalition against him was much bigger, while his base was crumbling. On May 23rd, the Hashid tribe joined the opposition, and its armed supporters clashed with the army in Sana'a. Both sides began shelling each other, which was the first signal of yet another civil war in Yemen. Although the belligerents eventually signed a truce, Saleh made another mistake a few days later. On May 29th, he ordered the army to restore control over the central square of Taiz, which was taken over by peaceful protesters. Dozens of protesters were killed. In early June, more protesters, now armed, fought back. Consequently, street battles broke out in Taiz. By June 7th, the government forces were pushed out of the city. The government chose violence against the people of Yemen, and violence was the response of the people. Fighting regularly broke out in Sana'a, Taiz, and other cities in Yemen. On June 3rd, there was a bombing at the presidential palace in Sana'a, which left Saleh severely injured, prompting him to leave for Saudi Arabia. The violence would not stop in his absence. According to Human Rights Watch, by October 2011, at least 225 people were confirmed dead since the start of the Yemeni revolution. Saleh would return to Yemen in September, but when even his staunch Saudi allies, who had supported his fight against the Houthis, advised him to leave, he finally agreed to sign the agreement proposed by the Gulf Cooperation Council. Saleh transferred his authority to Vice President Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi in exchange for legal immunity for him and his family. After 33 years in power, Ali Abdullah Saleh was finally ousted. Hadi was elected president in February 2012 in an election without an alternative for a two-year transition period. The unity government was evenly divided between the GPC and the opposition coalition joint meeting parties. Despite this, Yemen was far from restoring stability. In 2013, the National Dialogue Conference, headed by President Hadi and representatives of all major political forces in the country, was established with the goal of offering a program to solve a wide range of problems in Yemen. However, the lack of public trust in Hadi, who had long been Saleh's close ally, the inability of the government to solve the economic and political crisis in the country, and the absence of a reasonable program to address the grievances of the Zaydis and southern Yemenis, was eroding confidence in the ability of the coalition to govern Yemen. Pro-Saleh forces and the Houthis carried out measures to sabotage the government as well, which included damaging the vital infrastructure of the country, such as the water and power supply. In January 2014, the National Dialogue Conference signed the NDC document, which agreed on extending Hadi's presidency for another year, the 50-50 division of the parliament, the transformation of Yemen into a federal state, and the establishment of freedom of religion, the last of which was meant to placate the Shiite Zaydis. However, this document was not accepted by the Houthis and some southern forces, and the absence of a consensus ultimately made this attempt at reform meaningless. 
Clearly, the transitional government was crumbling, and the groups which were most interested in its demise, the Houthis and the former President Saleh, who wanted to make a comeback, sought to take advantage. After defeating the Salafis in Damaj, the emboldened Houthis expanded their area of control into the province of Amran. Despite fighting a war with the Houthis for several years, Saleh decided to join forces with them to fight against the government. He still had sympathizers in the army, who defected to join him. In September, the Houthis and Saleh attacked Sana'a, where people were protesting against the rise in fuel prices. Public disillusionment with the government was at an all-time high, and ordinary people were not inclined to defend it against an attack. Moreover, the Houthis stated that their target was the corrupt political elite, expanding their popularity among the general population with this populist message. Meanwhile, Saleh positioned himself as the person who could restore stability in Yemen. This unlikely partnership between Saleh and the Houthis captured Sana'a in September 2014 and forced Hadi to resign in early 2015 and flee to Saudi Arabia. There, Hadi called on the UN Security Council to stop the Houthi advance in Yemen. The UN Security Council Resolution 2216 recognized the Hadi government as the legitimate authority in Yemen, calling on all sides, including the Houthis, to lay down their arms and return to the negotiation table. Shortly before the resolution passed, Saudi Arabia, together with several other Arab states, launched an intervention to defeat the Houthi rebellion in Yemen and reinstall the government to power. The still ongoing Saudi intervention in the Yemeni civil war has proved deadly for thousands of people. They have conducted regular airstrikes on Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen that have caused a humanitarian disaster that the Yemenis are still suffering from. This Saudi intervention forced the Houthis to retreat towards the north and the west in some areas. Nevertheless, the Houthi Saleh coalition still controlled most of northwestern Yemen, including Sana'a and Taiz, where the majority of Yemenis lived. As they fought with al-Qaeda in the south and government forces in the south and east, the Houthis were also becoming more powerful than their pro saleh allies, particularly after taking the remnants of the Republican Guard under their control. Eventually and inevitably, infighting started. In 2017, Saleh publicly denounced the Houthis and called on everyone to fight them. However, only two days later, his Damash was defeated and he was killed by the Houthis. The UAE-backed nephew of the former president, Tariq Saleh, now had his own faction and had since announced himself by capturing Hodaida port and the area surrounding it on the Red Sea coast. In December 2018, the UN brought the government and the Houthis together, but despite a preliminary agreement, the talks eventually fell through. In 2020-21, the Houthis made a significant advance in the oil-rich Marib province, despite heavy bombardment by the Saudis. In September 2021, they also announced the capture of al Baida province. The fighting between the Houthis and the government forces had largely decreased in intensity by 2023. The Houthis, pro Saleh forces and the Saudi-backed government were not the only actors fighting in this civil war. Another important force was the Southern Transitional Council. The idea of Southern secessionism never really disappeared. And even though the South nominally sided with the government, the relations were never smooth. In April 2017, President Hadi dismissed the governor of Aden, Idaris al-Zubaydi, accusing him of close ties with the United Arab Emirates. In response, al-Zubaydi declared the Southern Transitional Council, or STC, and took over control of Aden. The council was supported by the UAE, and was now in open rebellion against the Saudi-backed government. Government forces tried to regain Aden and came close to it in August 2019, but then UAE airstrikes stopped their advance. In April 2020, the STC declared self-governance, which essentially meant independence. The council indeed took control over the southwestern part of Yemen, including Aden, Hadramaut, Abyan, and so on. Under Saudi pressure, the UAE forces eventually left Yemen in 2020, as the STC joined the Presidential Leadership Council, which has been an internationally recognized government of Yemen, despite still having a secessionist agenda. al Zubaydi is currently the vice president of the Presidential Leadership Council. So, at this point, the de facto political map of Yemen looks quite messy, comprised of the central government, its Houthi enemies, the separatist Southern Transitional Council, Tariq Saleh, and semi-independent tribal warlords and fundamentalist groups like Al-Qaeda. Additionally, none of the factions, including the government, enjoy legitimacy given by the people or cross-community support. 
the government relies on Saudi Arabia and tribal support, and is being led by the Presidential Leadership Council, consisting of people with very different interests. The Houthis, meanwhile, depend on Iran's political and military support. However, reducing them to mere proxies of Tehran would be too simplistic. They have been fighting Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates for over a decade, and it was only natural for them to seek allies. Iran was more than happy to boost a force that was fighting one of its main foes, Saudi Arabia, and to expand its geopolitical influence in the process. The fact that both sides are Shia made this alliance, in which Iran is the definitive senior partner, easier to establish. The Houthis have a decisively anti-American and anti-Israeli stance. This is not surprising, seeing as they have been one of the most active and significant actors in the Middle East since the war broke out in Gaza. They have attracted international attention for attacking military and commercial vessels in the Red Sea, inflicting major damage to international trade. They have openly supported Palestine and declared war on Israel, and just like other Iranian allies or proxies depending on your perspective, have been regularly attacking American military assets in the Middle East. The United States has brought together a coalition to protect the Red Sea from the Houthi attacks and has conducted airstrikes against them, along with seeking diplomatic means to persuade the Houthis to stop their attacks. However, at this point, it looks like the Houthis' aggression will continue for the foreseeable future. The latest civil war in Yemen is still going on, and none of the numerous sides fighting seems likely to achieve any meaningful victory anytime soon. According to the UN, as of 2021, 377,000 people have died in Yemen's modern civil wars, while millions more are at risk of famine. All sides have committed war crimes and human rights violations, and the Houthis have been accused of slavery. There is a lull in the fighting now, but it could escalate again, since the profound disagreements between the sides have not gone anywhere, and there is not much history of finding common political ground in modern Yemen. Unfortunately, Yemen is going through yet another cycle of violence and human suffering, and the end to it is not in sight. More videos on modern geopolitics are on the way. To ensure you don't miss that, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.